meeting of the Licensing Regulatory Committee today. Um, so I'll take the uh, introductions first and then I'll take apologies. Um, uh, Chairman, Licensing uh, County Council, Lynn the Guppy. Uh, Brian Stone, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman of this committee. Ellen Gailey, Solicitor. Paula Harris, Democratic Services. David Jones, Head of Public Protection. Linda O'Gorman, Principal Licensing Officer. Samantha Wynn, Senior Licensing Officer. Jim Higginson, Member, Caligot, Tailbone Ward. County Councillor Martin Hickman, Member of this Committee. Anne Webb, Member of this Committee. Uh, Ralph Chapman, elected member and member of this committee. Thank you very much. Can we um, take the apologies, please? Well, thank you, Chair. We've received apologies from County Councillors John Prosser, David Evans and Francis Taylor. Okay. Are there any declarations of interest um, on today's agenda? Yes, Madam Chairman. Item 7A. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll fill the form in and I'll be leaving the chamber at that point. Agenda item number three, to confirm and sign the minutes of the previous uh, meetings. Uh, 14th of June, 2016. Eighth of July, two thousand and sixteen. Okay. <laughs> That's so a subcommittee. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the nineteenth of June. Uh, sorry, the nineteenth. The last one was the 8th of July, and then the next one was the 19th of July. My mistake. Can we move? <coughs> okay, thank you. We go on to agenda item uh, for public protection performance report 2015 and 16. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, if I uh, zip through it, I won't go through it line by line, otherwise we'll be here till about one o'clock. Um, but basically, I'll cover the covering report initially. That's just advising why it's here. We do an annual performance report that covers the services within public protection, obviously well aware of licensing, but we also cover Vamp Health, train standards. <coughs> the purpose of the report is to give it a wider audience of members. It has gone to uh, Strong Communities Select. Uh, on the 21st of July. So it's, as I say, to give members um, an understanding of what we get up to. I think it's particularly pertinent this time of year with the budget um, reductions that we'll need to implement come April. So from, from an officer perspective, I think it's important to tell as many members as possible what we do and why we do it. So that, that covers the covering report. 3-2 outlines why it's here. In January 2015, Cabinet requested regular six monthly reports to that strong communities committee to monitor performance over time. We did have some reductions in April 2014, so it's important to see if there's any negative impact of those uh, reductions. And obviously to widen member involvement and understanding, it also assists to report this performance to uh, Licensing Regulatory Committee. 3.3, three, some of the highlights really, um, but I will touch on some of the stuff in the report. Four service teams, so you'll know some of these officers, many of them would have dealt with QO in, in terms of Vamp Health, domestic public health. Jill Dickin covers the commercial team in Vamp Health. Linda here, obviously, and obviously Gareth Walters covers train standards and animal health. Um, so we are generally complying with legal obligations. Most of what we cover is statutory duties. There's not much choice as to MCC to say we're not going to cover statutory nuisance, for example, or Licensing Act stuff. It's a requirement on us. The second bullet's just uh, to say there has been some decline in closing complaints within Q's team, which covers that domestic environmental health aspect of our work. 
However, I, what I did there, just to outline, we have a team of five and a half. I think what we forget sometimes is a capacity issue. We've only got five and a half officers that deal with a whole range of stuff, which I'll cover in the main report. Certainly, it's telling you that over one and a half thousand new service requests have picked up every 12 months, and that covers what members will be familiar with in terms of neighbour disputes, air quality, private housing complaints. There's a raft of stuff that uh, is picked up within that uh, 1,500 complaints. Uh, just says we, we will report every six months to the stronger communities. I suggest perhaps it comes here annually, so we'll do it this time of year in terms of uh, the complete financial year. Over the page, to give members some reassurance, we are audited externally. We do have governing bodies such as the Food Standards Agency. They cover the food safety aspects. We all raft really. We've got DEPRA, we've got DCMS, we've got Health and Safety Executive, we've got Drinking Water Inspectorate, uh, to name but a few. So basically, they obviously uh, oversee what we do and obviously comment accordingly. So I've covered why it's here. So that really covers the covering report. If so, touch upon some of the highlights within the report itself, which is attached. Um, the first one is a repeat of what I just said, including section one. Two covers the staff resources. So I mentioned the four teams. So in the commercial team, you've got 8.7 full-time equivalents covering what you, you know, the white coat guy who comes in. Um, food safety, uh, occupational health and safety at work, infectious disease control, obviously we follow up all salmonellas, E. coli incidents and that sort of issue. And that's very much governed by the Food Standards Agency and others as to what we do in that aspect. Public health is uh, Q. Owens' part of the world. Um, we do uh, stuff I'll pick up, which is the statutory nuisance, air quality, etc. Licensing, I think, we'll, we'll skip over that. Obviously, as, as members of this committee, you'll have a good understanding what uh, my colleagues here and uh, Chris Martin and Lee pick up in terms of licensing. Training standards, again, hopefully, I think many of you may have had dealings, particularly those in farming, in terms of what training standards are, and I'll get up to. So we've got 6.3 full-time equivalents covering that aspect, and we're supported by four FDs that support those teams. The financial resources there under Q2, that's sort of money we spent last year. Uh, the actual spend is 1.28 million. So there's a slight outturn there. You think, well, that, that would be handy, but they are one-offs. So there's, you know, for example, not replacing a member of staff mid-year. So we, we can't rely on that 58,000 underspend, 16, 17. So that's the financial position. Performance, as I say, I won't go through it in huge detail, um, but basically, just to give you assurance, that it's covered internally through service improvement plans. It is covered by um, what we call DMTs, so obviously there's a regular process of monitoring that performance to see how we're getting on. Supplemented with the internal reporting of 3.2, and that's the external governing body for which I um, touched upon earlier, um, of which there are probably at least 12 uh, in our world. 3.3 is uh, the report proper, if you like. And that what I've tried to do is obviously compare those performances. So obviously where we had a cutback um, back in April 2014, so column one picks up what it looked like before we had any staff reduction. 14-15 was the year before, and that's you know, what was the impact of that happening, and then obviously the current year. So we've got two years to compare what's happened post-staff uh, reduction. You'll see in terms of uh, the first team commercial, as we call it, basically that's holding its own in terms of what we're, we're doing in terms of uh, compliance with food businesses, service requests, etc. cetera, that um, we pick up. Obviously within that team, we're also picking up a lot of temporary vet notices and other stuff that obviously would start here, but obviously would ask for advanced health comments. And perhaps I'll use the Estev Hall as an example. They'll have at least 40 food vendors, so the commercial team will obviously check for not only food safety, they'll look at the health and safety aspects. We'll check the caravan park and plan over, so it gives obviously people assurance. Water safety as well, I think a lot of these things go on in the background, and I think members often think of the more visual stuff, the MCC tent, but that perhaps the work that's done in the background, uh, often by colleagues in environmental health. Communicable disease is fairly steady. So that's the stuff I talked about in terms of compiler batches, salmonellas, et cetera. So that's a fairly steady number per annum. The second team is, as I said, Hugh and his colleagues. So housing, they deal with 167 new service requests. That could be a tenant complaining about his housing conditions. And often we're dealing with very, very vulnerable people. So for example, we've had a piece of work 
there were takeaways in Abergavenny, two takeaways went up in smoke. So obviously we do, as a consequence of that, we went around every takeaway just to make sure that those standards are okay, working with the fire service to make sure people can use the escaper satisfactory. Dampness, overcrowding, are as issues that uh, are picked up by Van Tal. Noise is a big aspect of the work we pick up. So we had uh, over 300 new noise complaints last year. Over the page, um, we also categorise factory nuisance, which isn't noise, and that's smoke, bonfires, light pollution, and sort of a raft of other stuff that constitutes factory nuisance. So you'll notice a very sl it's a bit of a decline in closing complaints, be it noise or statutory, um, and that was a capacity issue really last summer. Environment protection, we pick up in terms of fouling, littering, fly tipping, which I think would be uh, a big concern for yourselves as local members. And again, we're trying to get to them as quickly as we can, where we've got obviously enforcement powers. Cleansing will pick it up, but if there are uh, evidence of who the perpetrators are, we'll, we'll seek to uh, take action. It's difficult often because it's in the rubble and you don't know where it's come from. And they don't tend to do it at three o'clock in the afternoon. They tend to be three o'clock at night. So that's another aspect. Pest control, interestingly, if you notice, has gone up threefold since we changed things around. And that's as a consequence of us cutting back the uh, the PMP contract was withdrawn. So we now deal with a lot more customers that say, look, we've got rats in the garden. Can you come out? Traditionally, you would have said, well, we've got a contract. We'll pass on your details and they'll, they'll pop out. Obviously, since people are a bit reluctant to pay 70 quid, they say it's not our rat. It's uh, potentially it's number 23s. You know, why are you picking on us? So you get involved with all sorts of issues in that respect. Licensing, I won't dwell on, but those are the numbers um, in terms of applications dealt with by the small team. Inspections carried out, so obviously proactively we do, as you know, taxi, taxis are regularly visited, plus obviously all our alcohol um, outlets, late night refreshment, etc. So I think members will be aware of the licensing function. The fourth team is trains down as animal health. Um, so again, visits are fairly static. So what you will find if you go on to the um, last page of the table is a drop in visits and animal health visits um, and health complaints. And we think probably because we've got less capacity to go out on our farms. Some farmers would welcome that. Um, but uh, in terms of animal movement licenses, etc., cetera, um, we're down to one and a half animal health inspectors for Monmouthshire. So you can imagine they're quite pushed because of the nature of the county. Feed law enforcement, the reason that's improved is that was a decree from um, Welsh Government and Food Standards Agency. We've got to sort that out and what happened is they ring fenced some money for that. So hence 100% of them were, were done. Um, so that's basically it and uh, also you know, <coughs> scam victims, we didn't report that as an issue a couple of years ago. Um, that's something we're obviously trying to pick up in terms of uh, scamming of vulnerable people. Finally on the thing, just that when we talk about capacity, freedom of information requests are forever on the increase. Those can be quite time consuming, often often trade led. They just want to know who's visiting who because they want to sell them some products. And the other one, which is a big raft of work is, is events. So I chair the safety advisory group and that does, we oversee 94 events last year. The big ones obviously fell upon the stud balls, which members will be aware of. But all those agricultural shows, all those street fates, etc., Christmas fairs, bonfire nights, is a piece of work that generally tends to fall with, within public protection. So I won't. I think I've done the analysis uh, as I've gone through. But basically, it's there for member uh, information. I think we like to see a few prosecutions to keep everyone on their toes. Uh, just very quickly on four one, uh, Wigmore Bakery. For those of you Monmouth, we can say this because it's in the public domain. Uh, they were prosecuted successfully. The King's Head and Usk, that hit the headlines. That was another one. And the reason we do it is we tell them and they don't really pay much attention. So it sends a healthy message. Obviously, we do a press release. We send a message out. And obviously, that uh, tends to have a desired effect with other traders. The one that I missed out on there was Mandarin Stone, again in Monmouth, where someone lost his eye with a hammer injury and they all went through his eye. So where things are quite serious, we think it's appropriate to um, prosecute. So that was a £20,000 fine. 
So I think it's just to make the point we're out and about and perhaps where members aren't aware of certain things, we are trying to ensure that the safety of um, people at work, people in what can be suspect housing, I mentioned that earlier. So it is very much a protection role for more mem vulnerable members of society. Uh, the housing ones there, I think I mentioned earlier, um, some of the vulnerable people in the poorest uh, living conditions. And Hugh provided some detail as to, you know, what are we picking up? And it is dampness and mould, it's excess cold, it would be falls, uh, unsafe stairwells, etc. And the risk of fire, as I say, we pick that up with the fire authority. So um, the noise, as you may expect, sorry, I'm going to zip through this because I'm aware of other agenda items. Um, in terms of uh, noise complaints, a third of those are the barking dogs ones. You know, people unfortunately leave the house and they're kind of yakking away. Uh, so we do have some powers to deal with that. We try and mediate if that doesn't work, we can serve notice. Other domestic noise complaints would, would be amplified music, would be, uh, you know, Johnny's got a drum kit for Christmas. That could cause a few issues. And then the other half are things like construction noise. So Hugh Owen, for example, spending a lot of time with the 465 uh, work at um, Gilworm Way. So obviously we try and ensure that they comply with the noise conditions that we inform planning to, ins to look at in terms of noise condition. That was a lot of uh, discussion to try and get that done and to try and obviously the Contractors want to get the job done ASAP, and we need to work with the residents to try and do it. The electrification, I was in the news yesterday. Mike Richardson, that some of you may know in Chepstow, a lot of time and effort, you know, probably 100 hours just dealing with, you know, the uh, electrification of that, the noise issues. When you start disturbing banking, the rats bounce around, and suddenly we've got a huge leap in uh, pest control complaints. So it's quite interesting. The, just quickly, the 465 obviously also involved as well exhumations of bodies, um, so things that perhaps you wouldn't think you get involved with, um, can be quite detailed. So that's uh, the complaint side of it. Something often gets overlooked is uh, air quality, and uh, we'd like to do more of that if we have the opportunity. Um, I think that's important. I think particularly with uh, well-being future generation stuff, there's an expectation that there will be more regard for that, so we will be hopefully doing some more work, particularly this year in terms of air quality. So I think that's, yeah, that's the last one on 4.2, uh, picks up air quality, and we have got a few air quality management areas, perhaps surprisingly enough, because of Bridge Street and Chepstow, you wouldn't, you'd suspect Hardwick Hill in terms of uh, traffic coming up a very steep incline. Um, as I say, licensing, I won't pick up on the 4.3. Members will have a good regard uh, understanding of what's happened there. Um, four, four, training time Dave, the Dave did you want to um, on 4.3? Um, yeah. Just before 4.4, the, the issue is the ongoing um, prosecu prosecution of that unlicensed driver, which I think has now been resolved. Yeah. I don't know if you want yeah. to fit yeah. that yeah. in or yeah. if you, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, obviously, it'd be an annual report, so no overrun. Yeah. So we try and pick up things that may be happening. But while, while Linda's looking that up, um, yeah, on the train standards front, uh, 3rd of August, last year, car dealer, RTT, pleaded guilty to three offences. Um, and that was a complaint by a family in Caldicott. So basically, the vehicle's deemed to be dangerous and unloadworthy. So that culminated in a... In a um, £500 for each offence, 2,200 cost. So again, that sends a message out to the used car traders that, you know, something we are looking at, etc. Scams, uh, as I say, is on the increase. On it's the more routine stuff about weighing equipment. Mm. And there was reference there to obviously doing some work with hospitals to make sure that dosages are right. I think that's quite important. Um, unfair contract terms, etc. So that's, um, and we do get involved with road trader week as well. Linda? quick update of the um, recent prosecution. Um, it was uh, against MG Travel, uh, an advocate of any firm, um, which used an unlicensed driver in a private hire vehicle on two occasions, and the one occasion was actually on the school run. So he had a hefty fine of £3,000 plus £884.54 costs and a surcharge of £150. Uh, so press release has gone out on that as well, and it's gone through Twitter and other media um, functions within Monmouthshire as well. 
to make people aware that we are out there and we don't take um, it lightly when people use unlicensed cannabis. So I'll just conclude, Chair, um, just in terms of the summary of next steps, which is on the final page on the, on the bundle. Um, so I said in the introduction, we are continuing to meet the statutory's legal obligation to, to, in most eventualities. Um, we tend to operate at maximum level. There's nothing we can do about the reactive nature of this. Um, and we do struggle perhaps if we literally have one officer off, be it on honeymoon or longer term absence, then we, that's when we do struggle somewhat. Uh, I've referred to um, the Wales Audit Office. Uh, they conclude that uh, the council is generally delivering vamp health services at above minimum levels, despite significant budget cuts. Stakeholders are more mostly positive about current services, but have a low awareness of future plans. The council will find it difficult to take on new statutory duties that protect the public and the environment. FSA is the other one I mentioned earlier. They reaudited in February of this year. Uh, they conclude good progress made on our action plan. The services coping with ex expectations within existing will within the existing resources available. So I think the sort of general message is we're coping. Mm -hmm. We are very conscious of new legislation and it, it did come up in strong communities. Um, so for example, we're gonna have to uh, register all private landlords in November. So you, you get a bit of money from Welsh Government, but generally, I mean, Licensing Act is a good example. It doesn't cover your actual cost. Um, so we expect tenants, as soon as we get advice to that, obviously the levels of uh, complaints will increase from those numbers I mentioned earlier. So typically, and private water supply is another one, so the money come in doesn't equate to the actual cost to the authority. So that's something we're going to have to uh, consider carefully going forward. In terms of next steps, we are now part of social care and health, so I report now to, to Claire March. In fact, I think that's probably healthy in terms of getting over the messages about health and well-being, vulnerable people, safeguarding. So I, I think that's a handy uh, link to our colleagues in social care, um, which is picked up in 6.1. Um, the future of monitor work clearly will have, will work with that to see how we can be as efficient as possible. I mentioned uh, private landlord legislation coming in. Uh, th there's also a red tape review. I think centrally perhaps people think that is it too much and we're onerous on businesses. The feedback we get locally is businesses are very receptive and thankful for us turning up. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer really that we're there being... Um, heavy-handed, we're very much working with the trade to, to seek improvements. And I mentioned earlier, well-being and future generations. So I think there's an opportunity for us to link better to wider agendas, to um, put over not just the members, to the wider audience and government bodies, the importance of what uh, public protection services deliver. My final bit, before we move on, Chair, is uh, Chief Medical Officer, Ruth Hussey, who uh, retired this year. I think it's an interesting quote in terms of vamp health work we pick up, um, highlights the importance of work in vamp health in dealing with public health concern concerns as diverse as cancer, obesity, infectious diseases, asthma, falls, and excess winter death. I've also highlighted the growing public health importance of alcohol control, colleagues in, in licensing sit with us, sunbeds, body piercing, air pollution, housing standards, and food hygiene. In vamp health contributes to the wider national agenda for health, well-being, and public service improvement and plays an important direct and indirect preventative role. So I think what I've tried to do in the whistle stop tour of uh, many services is just try and highlight what we do, I've tried to quantify it in numbers, Chair, and obviously um, try to stress the importance of it. Um, and as I say, I think that's particularly pertinent because of the uh, position that Monmouthshire and other local authorities find itself. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Comprehensive, and I just think, it, as you said, it's a whittle, whistle stopper um, of the work um, is undertaken um, by, I would say, is quite a small, relatively small team, really um, working. I would say, uh, nearly maximum capacity. Um, there's one question, sort of, of like in view of um, about taking on new um, statutory duties. Um, are we putting any? Um, actions into how, how we're going to uh, meet that challenge. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's always a difficult one, and we're not quite sure what's going to happen from one year to the next. So last year, we preparing ourselves for the Public Health Bill, which would have culminated in, obviously, controls over um, 
e-cigarettes, so that will have taken a role in enforcement, also um, strengthening body piercing, etc. Public toilets is all part of that, obviously that fell at the final um, barrier at uh, Welsh Government level, I think we had a bit of a tiff and uh, it was rejected. So I think that's going to be reintroduced, but we'll have to wait and see what that tells us. The one we do know is coming in is, is the private sector housing one we know. To answer your question, we do lobby also with professional bodies, so I'm a member of Public Protection Wales. We will lobby, we'll meet with Welsh Government regularly to make sure that obviously the funds hopefully stack up and uh, meet any new burdens, because as you say, if we're at maximum capacity now, if anything new comes in, the wheels may fall off the wagon, so uh, we try and work with colleagues in Welsh Government, which we do get on well with, um, to try and make sure that the resources match expectation. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I, I got three questions. Really. That, that some of them, be, one certainly goes into the next um, agenda item, but I, I can raise it now, I think. But first of all, noise. Now, um, without naming the, the, the public house, we have spoken to the Environment and Health Officers in Chepstow about it. The, uh, you've got um, vehicles going into pub car parks, which are next to houses, half past five in the morning, and emptying uh, containers, of contain containers of bottles. And you can imagine the racket that is with that. And I, 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 it isn't my ward, but I did, I, and I mentioned it to the ward member. But, um, uh, and he's, you know, he's gonna take it up. But for, me, for my part, it's not on that, that, that uh, collection vehicles are going into, pub, in, in, into pubs and, 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 and emptying these, these um, containers of bottles, and they're they big containers, and they make a heck of a racket at half past five in the morning. No, I, d I don't think that's on. And in the same pub, you've got delivery vehicles there going at six o'clock in the morning and before. Now, I don't think that's, either, uh, that's on either. You only got barrels rattling about. It's as bad as the bottles rattling about. And, uh, you know, people are entitled to a bit of peace and quiet. And... Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, I, I'm asking what is the legislation on that in terms of noise? Pick that one up, Pick that one up first, please. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit tricky when it's, you know, it's easier to deal with karaoke or fixed noise sources. Um, so it is difficult when it's a bit more intermittent. I'm sure the HO will pay more visits. What we try and do is work, it won't be MCC because we're not out at five in the morning, I'm glad to say. So we've got Biffa and Thomas's and all the external waste contractors on the roadside. What we'll do, try and do is work with the, the company to see if they can change their route. I mean, what's happening is obviously they're starting in Caldicott at five and the glass is particularly noisy for people there. Yeah, I'll check back with the, the Chepstow colleagues to see what we're dealing with there. Um, but basically, uh, if they are causing excess disturbance, then obviously we would approach it from the Environmental Protection Act 1990 approach. So we'll try and mediate to see if there's any way around it, and then if, if there isn't any, and then obviously it's for them to go back to their contractors and say if they can change it, but I, I anticipate an excellent provider at MCC, and try and work with them to, to, for reasonableness. We often deal with construction noise similarly, and dust and not just the noise, and uh, sometimes for obviously new places it's easier if you can do it through planning conditions. You know, often we'll restrict the hours of operation during construction, and that's what we're doing at 465. More difficult with this, but I'm sure that if we liaise with uh, the pub plus the contractors, then hopefully we'll try and seek some resolution for the neighbours. If I can perhaps comment on from a Licensing Act perspective, I mean, regardless of the, the name to the legislation, which has that powers as well, under the Licensing Act, every, every pub and club have a duty to prevent public nuisance as well. So we'd, we'd have to have a look at to see what is actually on the conditions of that license to see if they've got anything in place if they've actually stipulated a time they will empty sort of glasses and, and bottles from the venue. But then we would also work with environmental health with that pub venue to ensure that they work towards preventing public nuisance. So any information you got on that, then they can uh, investigate it further for you. Uh, I mean, I, I come back. If you, if you consider the, 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 the extensive hours that some of these um, license, uh, these licensed premises have, and uh, at the end, once they once they closing up, the first thing they do is cleaning all the, all the old bottles and everything, and, and slinging them in. So this could be twelve o'clock in the night, and when you've got a wagon coming around there at half past five in the morning, which is not that much, five and a half hours uh, on. 
people's lives are disrupted. There's no argument. And, 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 and the chairman knows the, the pub I'm on about in, 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 in Cali, but there are houses and old age pensioners, bungalows all around it. And it's, it's not on for them people to be suffering as a, you know, from a noise problem, but the morning ones are the ones that we complain about. The other one I want to—I want to this question. It is, and you talk about fire extinguishers in in taxis. Now, when when I had a when I had a study caravan, I had a fire extinguisher in there, and um, there's a date, a, a best before date, if I put it that way, or if you've got fire extinguishers that examine on a on a regular basis, then there's a little sticker put on them, and when as to when they'll examine, um, you know, and they fit the purpose. In relation to taxis. Uh, are those fire extinguishers um, subject to the same examination? Please. There is a, a report following this report now on that subject, on, ta on fire extinguishers, um, and it's obviously up to members to, the, to see if they ag agree with the recommendations that's been put forward with regards to fire extinguishers. Perhaps we can leave it until the second report. Councillor Webb. Yeah, thank you. Can I thank you for the report, which is um, really... Do you want to... Sorry? Oh, oh, sorry, you one with, you were, uh, two of them about noise. Sorry. Delivery vehicles and noise. <laughs> thank you so much for this um, really interesting report, detailed report, and also for the professional way in which you deal with any problems, um, you know, on the phone or whatever. I think it's um, very professional the way you deal with things. Thank you very much. Um, one thing is, I know that you're, you're uh, monitoring the um, air pollution in Chepstow and in Ask, but what can you do about it? Okay, you monitor it, but is there any solution to it? Only stop traffic going up the um, the hill and uh, through us. <laughs> no, yeah, good question. Obviously, uh, the, f the A48, as you know, is uh, Welsh government owned. It's a trunk road. Uh, what what they do is they come up with an action plan, which we need to vet. It's done with the Chamber of Commerce and Town Council, I believe. So our regular meetings locally. What you can do about it is a big problem, isn't it? Initially, they're going to bypass the whole shebang, won't they? As if you look at Thornwell, there's a there's a cutting that was due to, to I mean, I don't think financially it's uh, it's going to happen. I think it's for um, to oversee that action plan because there's issues with the bulwark turn, if you're turning right from the bulwark road to go into town, that's an issue. So I think the options are on the table. Um, I think perhaps disappointingly, Welsh Government said, well, hopefully when electric cars come in, uh, that's going to really knock it on its head a bit, but we don't really want to wait 10 years for that to happen. Everyone's floating up and down Hardwick Hill. Um, so I think there is an action plan on the table. Hugh Owen chairs that meeting. Paul White's working behind the scenes in terms of trying to get something moving. That's a difficult one because it's a trunk road and there's no way around it. Um, and I think some lorries are avoiding the toll on the seven bridges, which doesn't help. On the second one, the US one, it's traffic orders and working with highways to try and, uh, it is notorious though, if I drive through, I'm pulling my hair out, there's a van parked up, isn't there, on Bridge Street. Everything backs up and it's a nitrogen dioxide is the pollutant that's coming from traffic. So again, and also uh, the bridge itself, to try and restrict HGVs on the bridge, um, Woodside, they need access to. So we do lorry watch as well with training standards to try and limit that. And again, working with um, the town council and the chamber of commerce again to get the message to traders. So that is something within our gift because it's uh, it's an MCC highway. So the second one's easier than the Chepstow. There's now, please. Thank you very much. I'm always talking about this, the, these um, FOI requests. I really, really do think that we should seriously think about charging for this. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I really think that some are frivolous. And I think that um, I'm, I'm always saying this, that it, it's so time consuming um, for the department involved. Well, that's just a comment, really. And um, there was. Yeah, no, I mean, you'd, you'd have to change national legislation. Um, you never know with Brexit, maybe you know, all that. Uh, <laughs> scrap that one, I don't know. Um, right. But it is, it is onerous and it, it is on the increase. And I think corporately we do with over a thousand per annum. Right. And the other yeah. find is the um, new legislation coming in with regard to landlords. Will you be um, um, having courses here or um, to. Um, yeah, so. um, yeah as, as we're nearing, well, it's fairly close now, isn't it? I think it comes in 26th of November, two months off. There will be publicity. Some of it's supposed to be coming from Rent Smart Wales. The licensing will be done centrally through Cardiff, and obviously we're there to oversee it. But in terms of training, take your point. 
Amy Lawton is the officer that's dealing with housing, so I'll make sure, bearing in mind it's two months off, what messages we're getting out to those private landlords, yeah. There is one bit about legislation, um, I was just thinking of it now as uh, Dave was speaking, it is the um, old designated public places orders which have been changed um, and that we have to uh, get a report in to see if they either continue with those designated public places or as we recall, they were, um, if um, somebody's drinking alcohol and causing a nuisance basically, does, it doesn't aut an automatic ban on alcohol and we had a number of areas in Bailey Park, um, the other area in Abergavenny, there's two areas in Abergavenny and then it was the whole of Monmouthshire mm -hmm. um, and it was um, Linda Vista Gardens was another area within um, Abergavenny. So there'd be a report actually coming through on that because um, it will also deal with the dog fouling element as well as the alcohol element. So there's a number of things you can actually put under the new orders basically that's um, it's going to change to. So that's why I think it will even still be done by um, 1st of October, I think 2017, but I'm just opening my mouth up for the, the date, where we've got to get mechanisms in place and see if we want to keep with them or extend them or change the area and put other sort of conditions on it. So there is a, a, a slight uh, tweak in legislation on that. Could I ask a question, a quick question on that one, in relation to the, the, you know, the alcohol or the, the waste, couldn't the police put a dispersal order on that? as a consequence of a, a request from you in a bit of that group? I know that it's, it's much wider element. You can put conditions on this. You can look at a number of things if it's causing a nuisance within that. You might have to have a look at the legislation in depth, but that's something that we can sort of have a look at when it comes to actually a report that's been submitted to this committee to see the viewpoint on it. Thank you. Just on that, I mean, um, a, a report was presented to Cabinet last week I'm pretty sure top of my head, the example of social behaviour, police and crime act 2014. And that covers, that's giving powers, delegated powers to myself in terms of some of the environmental health stuff, delegated powers to Rachel Jarrett in terms of some of the littering issues, and also Will McLean in terms of the partnership. So that's Andrew Mason to try and get the police more involved. I think to answer your question, Mark Williamson, is if we have got powers for police health, you know, it's just important to sort of widen the net, if you like, so we can use it safer officers can also pick that up as well. Can I just bring in um, Brian? Is it, is it follow on? It, it's just uh, going on to the air pollution in us, uh, David. Obviously, I've been involved with that for probably seven or eight years now, uh, and I know the work that you and Paul have done is, it, it is valuable. But very often the uh, levels uh, are of nitrous oxide are well above the, the, the limit. Um, it is a difficult one, and uh, it's mainly well. A lot of it is caused by uh, traffic parking in the in the main street and uh, causing a tailback. Um, so it, it's really the town council and the MCC are working together to try and get round the uh, the, the uh, lorry problem and travelling through us, just, just to confirm what you've said, David. Um, the other thing I, I just wondered, uh, I've noticed people are having quite substantial fines on um, food hygiene, etc. Uh, what happens to the, the, those, those, those monies? Are they, uh, do they go to the court or do they uh, find their way back to MCC? Yeah, unfortunately, the fines go to central government. Um, the costs that we ask for in court comes to us. Um, and I do tend to ask for large costs. Uh, they're discretionary on the part of the magistrates whether they give us, but they tend to give it to us. Um, and what, they, what I've noticed over the year, last few years is they, they would reduce the fine because they know that we'll get more money as a result. So they, they've upped the costs and reduce the fine because they know that goes to central government where in fact we should be getting it really. But uh, that's the way the system works, I'm afraid. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, littering, we all know, sort of um, on the increase and worse in, in, in some places than others, and even cigarette ends is a nuisance. I sit in court regular and Blinder Gwent, Torvine and uh, Newport seem to go down the route of having a um, uh, company uh, to, to enforce this, and I understand that it's a zero cost to the authority. Um, if it's a £50 fixed penalty, £5 or so goes to the authority. 
I know that's nothing, but they've got no costs, so to speak, and uh, they get the balance. Uh, have we looked at doing something like that? Yeah, it's um, a bit of a contentious one. I mean, there's pros and cons. Uh, the, the big con is it clogs up the court systems as Mickey Mouse of uh, 22 Noddy Land. Um, but also the issue is that if you're, they're not picking up, they're not tapping dog fouling in parks. They're looking for easy victims because if you can trap me to just, you know, I'm on a, you know, no win, no fee type arrangement, isn't it? But they have had some ridiculous cases of orange peel, bits of cotton being dropped because this is an elderly person. We're going to, you know, stick a fixed penalty notice on them. You can drive it and obviously they're all on commission. So that's why it's zero cost. But, you know, personally, uh, there's a severe health warning on that that, you know, members we bombarded, I suspect, with trivia that, you know, why the hell haven't the council got better things to do than tackling, um, and it tends to be Tesco Extra and some of the pubs and, and fag butts. Mm. Take your point, it's a bit unpleasant, but perhaps a better way is trying to put a fag butt bin outside the pub because they can't smoke weed within. So that is an issue. It's something we have explored. So I know Hugh Owen and others uh, have looked at it, and obviously we do look at a cost to rent to see what the issues are. I think the feedback for the Blan and Grants is quite negative. I can't remember the name of the company, like Cheese or something, something. Um, but clearly that's the issue with people on pay as you go, is they're going to deal with low level crime. They're not doing anything about dog violence because it's contentious and this guy's got a Rottweiler. Because if you're going to get your 10 quid, you may as well do it through someone who's 82 that may not argue the and pay yeah, the fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're right. And it, it is about trying to tackle those, you know, particular areas. And, you know, there are pubs that, you know, quite notorious for the fag butts. I think it's about working with the trade. It is an option, but, you know, it's one that is, is a bit difficult because of the negative publicity that tends to come with it. Um, but not dismissing it, certainly littering is an issue. The other quick one on a litter is um, uh, we're also expanding the fixed penalty notice provision. It has come up in council and cabinet, I think, control to include um, waste and street services. So they'll have powers to issue fixed penalty notices for littering as well. So hopefully, well, that, that's the whole point. Yeah, we've got one and a half staff within environmental health that have got doing that. And basically they're out water sampling and other stuff as well. So to try and increase that, um, we've increased it to um, Carl Tuig's team that they've got people out and about, so there'll be some more capacity. The frustration for us is we'll train up all the PCSOs and they think, great, wonderful, probably 20, 30 hours of effort for us and they, they've yet to serve one. So it is, you know, littering is an issue, not being dismissive of it, councillor, uh, it is an issue. And I think let's try and focus on those more difficult areas, but certainly the contracted route is uh, fraught with difficulties, should we say. Jamie, your best hand off the mic. Move the chapter report. Mm. We'll agree in that. <laughs> Just thanks again for the tremendous amount of work and um, compre comprehensive feedback. And I sort of sometimes the the amount of work and time spent, um, the public may not see what's going on, but um, certainly this s summary uh, does cover it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair, and obviously I'll feed that back to the teams that deliver the services. Thank you. Go on to um, agenda item five, um, amendment to taxi and private hire policy and conditions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the report has been brought here today and just a few tweaks on the actual um, taxi and private hire policy conditions that were adopted that came into force on 1st of April 2016. The two um, main elements are the um, actual M1 or M2 category and N1 or N2 category in 2.1 of the report. What that basically means is that the way the vehicles are registered, M1 or M2 are uh, equipped to carry passengers. 
and the N1, N2 are goods vehicles in, a, in essence. Um, what we had in the original um, condition was that we wouldn't accept N1 or N2 unless they actually physically change their category to M1 or M2 vehicles. It's now become apparent that the DVSA actually won't do that. However, what they will do is actually um, issue the British single vehicle approval, if it was pre-31st of December 2009, or issue a British individual vehicle approval from 1st of January 2010. So that will then actually stipulate in essence that it is in fact safe to carry passengers. Um, the reason why we requested to change that a lot of our disabled access vehicles have been adapted and are in fact N1 or N2 categories. So it'll mean it will have to get rid of all those unless this policy is changed. But in order to ensure that public safety is met in all elements, that we would insist if they are N1 or N2, that they have those um, vehicle approval <coughs> certificates from the DVSA. So that's the reason why the report is, um, we've asked to sort of uh, amend those um, from the, the, the original one where we had to change it from N1 to M, but now we're saying it can still have the N, providing they've got those extra certificates. So that's the first recommendation. The other recommendation is regards to fire extinguishers. Um, initially in the policy, we had stated that um, the actual extinguishers, they had to be marked up, they had to be marked up with a registration number, they had to be properly serviced. Um, there are concerns that's been raised, and I've, I've gone to other neighbouring authorities with regards to um, fire extinguishers in vehicle where we actually stipulate they have to be in the vehicle. The, the main um, concern is that if you've got a driver with passengers there, they may try and tackle it what they initially think is a small sort of fire that could suddenly ignite the vehicle quite swiftly. So they feel um, in the interest of public safety that rather than getting somebody to use a fire extinguisher, they just get the, the passengers out to a safe area, basically. So that's the other element that we are looking to change. In that, we would still have sort of refer to sort of fire safety but the fire safety would be that in the instance of all fire, in all circumstances, stop the vehicle and escape the time to a safe distance without straying into the casualty. So that answers your question. I mean, it is up to the individual driver if they still want to put a fire extinguisher in it, but it isn't us insisting on it. We insist that they get them to a safe area, basically. So that's the two tweaks of the actual policy itself. It, it doesn't need to go out, uh, I feel, um, for consultation because the first one is they aren't able to do it. The DVSA say they can do it by another element. And the second one is actually removing a condition, but making sure they go to a safe area for public safety purposes. And that's the reason why it hasn't gone out to consultation. So um, that's the basis of this report. And I, I'll leave it to yourselves then if you agree with the recommendations in 2.1 and 2.2. So any comments or questions? Can I come back to this thing about the examination of fire extinguishers on an annual basis and, uh, and an appropriate sticker put on it? This, this extinguisher was, was uh, I don't think it's possible, but tested and found to be okay on a such and such date, you know, 2016. And, uh, you know, 12 months time, will the same thing need to be done to ensure it's still compliant or efficient as a fire extinguisher? So with the, the new policy change, um, it is actually saying that we will remove the fire extinguisher, so we won't have any testing being done on it. Our main aim is to get the passengers out to a safe place. Any comments on what members feel about uh, the removal of the fire extinguisher? Could I, could I just ask a, a question in view of um, if we didn't want it removed then we should be adding in within our policies that the fire extinguisher needs checking and I, I'm not quite sure that the, um, the statutory um, checks that's needed within a vehicle um, but I know the, the fire extinguisher need annual checking um, but also th there's a change uh, every so often that they need to be changed as well but I'm not quite sure if that's within buildings and that applies to a smaller a fire extinguishers that would be held in a car. That, um, does that pose 
if this committee um, goes with the removal, uh, not having the removal, does that pose um, a problem in view of um, re-looking at our policies and procedures? The actual current policy um, answers all that, those questions, actually. Um, it is stipulated in the, the actual wording as it currently stands is, uh, the registration number of the vehicle shall be marked upon the extinguisher at all times. The extinguisher must be serviced in accordance with manufacturer's instruction and always be placed after use or in accordance with any date specified by the manufacturer. Only use the fire extinguisher for minor fires. And then it goes on to say in all other circumstances you need to use afterwards. So it's covered in that. It is their duty to ensure it is serviced, to ensure that it is in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Mm -hmm. So it is their duty to do it. And obviously, as with all enforcement, if it, if it remains in there that we want the fire extinguisher to remain in the vehicle, that it would be up to us enforce, to enforce any conditions anyway. And if it is found that it is in compliance, with the, the dates which you've mentioned <coughs> or serviced accordingly, <coughs> then obviously we would take action on, on the driver with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wonder, if it, is there a difference in um, a taxi, uh, an ordinary car with a fire extinguisher? Yes, it's very easy to get somebody out of the, the back if there's not a collision or whatever, the reason for the fire. But what about a minibus or something like that where you've got say 10 or 12 people and it is not so easy to vacate that vehicle because you'd have some people panicking anyway thank you we have got um extra conditions within the taxi policy for um i'll say four to eight passengers um whereby the seats have to be sort of you know they can't be sort of moved or anything like that to ensure safe exit quickly for large number of uh, passengers within up to eight seats as well. So you have got the further conditions, but I, I take your point that if there is no extinguisher and you've got a number of people, is it better to have one than not, you know? Um, but the other concern is you could have a small fire and then suddenly ignites quickly, you know? So, and somebody could be left in trying to tackle a fire where they could have got those people out. So it's, a, it's hard to get the right balance really. Um, In relation to minibuses, uh, you, uh, um, anything with less than eight seats becomes a taxi, in effect. But anything over eight is subject to separate uh, licensing issue. I just want to make that point. Yes, it's actually the PSC um, is separate in it, actually, for eight. Yeah, in view of the uh, two recommendations, oh, well, would you want to take them in block or individually? In block? Okay. Um, uh, we've, we've had a proposal and a seconder. Um, can I have a show of hands, please, for um, recommendation 2.1 and 2.2? Madam Chairman, before we move on, did ask if we could have a copy of the update to these policies because if I see any infringement, I very often look at the policies I've got now. Are they going to be out of date? So it would be, would be helpful if we had the up to date. Yeah, I recall um, you actually saying that. What we, we tend to do is actually refer to the sections in the new policy on every report anyway. So it's, we don't run the risk of that. You don't refer to the, the policy in itself in its entirety. But I'll take your point. I mean, I, I know... Um, maybe another training exercise because you have had another tweet but we will certainly get um, a, a new book uh, folder to yourselves with new policies in so I know we've had street trading and we've had the taxi stuff um, as well go on to our agenda item six application for annual block street trading consent for Abergavenny
morning, Ben. For the purpose of um, the committee, please could you introduce your, yourselves today? Mm. Hello, uh, Ben Winstanley, Estates Manager, responsibility for markets also. Hi, Sharon Hutchinson, um, Abgabeni, Market Manager. Thank you, Ben. Would you like to present the, the report? Or, or if, yeah. if you like, um, I'll, go, I'll quickly go through the report and then um, Ben and Sharon can then answer any questions that may be put forward um, in regards to the report itself. Uh, an application was received by the licensing section on the 30th of August 2016 from Sharon Hutchinson, who's here today, um, uh, from the Facility for Market section for an Abergavenny Town Centre Block Street trading. So that's the purpose of this report coming today. Um, the areas that's in question, the plans attached to the report, are Plan 1, Abergavenny Castle, Plan 2, Linda Vista Gardens, so 50 Pitches, St John's, 23 Pitches, Plan of Street 7 Pitches, Neville Street, 23 Pitches, High Street, 33 Pitches, Cross Street, 70 Pitches, Brewer's Yard, 50 Pitches, and Baker Street, which is 10 Pitches. Plan 3, then, is Penny Pound, 50 Pitches, and Bailey Park, 50 Pitches. Um, one of the um, uh, items within the actual application form is that the, the applicant has actually stated that they will have extra conditions over and above our street trading policy conditions, and those being that they are happy for trading will not be permitted in any area that contravenes traffic regulation orders, highway law, facilities and markets to notify the licensing section when events other than regular markets are taking place, Trading is subject to road closure where applicable, and trading on certain area is subject to approval from relevant departments. So I know there are concerns, um, and if you see those concerns, which are actually in 3.4 of this report, following consultation on the application form, um, basically the, the, the objections, um, or their concerns, I should say, rather than objection, are from car parks, um, and they uh, go on to say about the loss in car parking spaces um, basically within that. And that is really answered in the extra condition, trading on certain areas is subject to approval from relevant departments. Because even those, um, and I'm sure the applicant will actually say as well, that we have plans with a number of pitches in various areas. It's not um, a regular occurrence. It will be as and when an event takes place and then they will contact the relevant department car parks obviously being one of them, so perhaps that answers the actual um, query there. Traffic management um, from the Gwent Group had concerns in regards to note the trading time seven days a week, though 700 to 2300 hours, I appreciate this is a cover all time, but possibly 2300 hours is a little late with other nighttime use of the town centre. We have actually done block street trading in a number of areas and they tend to sort of be around that time, but whether they'll go to that extent and perhaps the applicant can then actually sort of state their intentions of how they're going to use the block street trading before you reach your decision today. So that's <coughs> the um, main objections to it. Um, like I said, we are, um, the, the areas there uh, in Abergavenny block street trading, we have got a number of ones that I've touched upon. We've got one in Chepstow, we've got one in Esk, um, we've got one in Monmouth, and we've also got the Caldergot Castle as well. So make it easier for people who want to have a cold event where they can manage it and sort of um, instead of having to come to us every time to get a street trade and consent when they say an event takes place so they can manage the event throughout the year. So that's the main aim of the block street trade and I'm sure the applicant would be able to answer any questions that you have. Can I also further say since this report, um, Councillor Douglas Edwards actually came back because um, there was quite a tight time still to get um, the consultation out. But Councillor Douglas Edwards say he supports the application. He's the actual ward member for that area as well. Um, one other further point that if it is granted today, that um, the applicant has also discussed that with myself, that we would actually commence the block street trading from 1st of October, which isn't in this report. And the reason behind that is the Abergavenny Food Festival have already made applications for street trading consents and they've been granted and you can't have two in the same area. So when it comes to that next year, they'll obviously be managed by the facility for markets for events within Abergavenny Town Centre. So it's recommended that it actually commences from 1st of October. Thank you. Councillor Chapman, do you want to? 
Thank you, Chairman. I've got no problem with his application. I think, you know, Abu Bengal as well as Western Monmouthshire attract a lot of people into the area and, and, and a lot of people come back. As far as the car park is concerned, some of the events that go on, we do provide temporary car parking to replace those last two events. So I don't think there's any concern there. And, you know, I support this application. Yes, thank you. Um, I would support it too. Um, uh, Abbot of any town council, their comments are incorporated in 3.4, I take it, are they? Did you or did you have a separate um, response from the town council? Yeah, sure, Abbot of any town council haven't actually come back um, with regard to the consultation. They've been informed, um, but we have no um, comments on that. So we can just assume at this stage that um, it, they are fine with it. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, well, I don't know how, how, how long ago they were informed, but I didn't see it come through the town council. There's a meeting tomorrow night, so it is, if it's a tight scale, a time scale, they might not have seen it. But I'm sure if John, if John Prosser was here as well, he'd be fully in favour of it. Um, you know, it makes sense to uh, come in line with other towns uh, within Monmouthshire at any rate. Um, and, um, yeah, fully support it. I just sort of want to ask, um, obviously um, parking can be an issue um, but from some of the information that we've received today, but um, it says about uh, residence permit holders' uh, permission, which obviously costs them a fee. Um, how are we going to manage this um, in view of, are we going to protect those residential um, car park spaces? Um, and if not, are we going to offer, um, um, you know, some return in um, their annual fee? I think, as uh, as Linda stated earlier, we'll do it in uh, uh, in consultation. We'll look at the specific areas. Y you know, the, the ideal situation is that we actually avoid um, having to take away those kind of permits, uh, permit holders, or, or ones that are, are required for residents. Um, entirely, uh, it, it might be uh, required in some instances, but we'll, we'll we'll look to mitigate those if it's required. I think the majority of the ones that are going to be in the car parks will be in the larger car parks, of which we have a few in Aberdeen, and um, yeah, we'll work with the car parking section in order to um, you know make make sure that the, the impact is minimised. Did you want to um, give a further overview or add anything that's not into the report um, to present to the committee? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be succinct. Um, yeah, the, um, th th this is along the same lines as, as what we've done in Monmouth um, uh, to sort of regularise the, 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 the affair. We've got a, a team which are local, they're proactive, um, we want to do, we've seen the success of things like the Abergavenny Food Festival and this is um, one less barrier to us replicating events such as this um, in the town. Um, this I, I appreciate the conditions in there, uh, you know, they don't give us carte blanche to just carry on. Uh, we'll do it in consultation with all the other uh, people noted. But yeah, looking forward to it. There is one extra thing as well, which um, is not mentioned previously, is that when the um, facilities team actually carry out a booking, they will actually use the application for a day market pitch, which is attached to the report as Appendix C. So that enables them to ensure that all the ones who are booking with them comply with the actual policy con and conditions of street trading. Um, in the past, we've put a condition in, sorry, and I don't know if I've over, um, overseen it, that on these events that the relevant departments are informed of any additional events. Um, it, 
Is, is that it, is yeah, that is it, um, have I missed today? it? Is it in? Is it? Yeah. The is items are listed in two point two of the report okay, will actually fine. go on the complaint as well. Okay, thank you. And so, one further question: Are you um, thinking of putting any new events on to? Um, you know what events? There's many events going on go on in Abergavenny at the moment. Um, have you got anything interesting um, that you're you, you know hope to be planning or that? Um, um, I've got some extra interest that um, obviously um, this um, extra consent um, and license would bring uh, and make life a lot easier. Um, well, Sh Sharon's been very successful at um, building on the events that have been in the town hall specifically. Um, I think we had a very successful uh, toy fair this year that, that that's within the town town hall there was it was very well received um the the, uh, the the initial thrust was around additional trading spaces in and around the town um uh, not to detract from the retail uh, the retailers that are already there but yeah we're, we're looking at additional markets th things in the pipeline are things like um other food you know food focused markets um we have some really reliable craft traders which um, we'd like to build on their reputation we also have regular market traders within the um, with the town hall at the moment which you know want opportunities to do more so yeah uh, specifics I, 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 I'm not telling you at the moment but <laughs> but can yeah I there will be can I also say that um, with a large number of the events that take place in Abergavenny uh, a lot of the events will actually go through the event safety advisory group as a, as a matter of course anyway when events take place so it wouldn't just be sort of the license element of the other people that would actually look at it as well the local members madam chairman seem yeah. to be all in favor of events yeah. better move it Did you want to? Have you got a comment? No, well, it's not regarding this. It's just something. Um, the, the streets all been refurbished, and uh, benches are being removed already. And uh, it's a very hot topic in Abergavenny at the moment. There's some a lot of emails going around due to this, and there's a lot of annoyed people uh, because we're looking at a laughing stock. We just spent a million pounds renovating the streets, and already the the benches have been took up. We moved just yesterday, uh, a week in front or five days in front of the food festival. I've had emails all over the place, so um, please note that. D ben, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, Councillor Hickman well, uh, noted, um, of course, I think this gives us a little, um, the, the one opportunity that the improvements within the town gives us is there is a little bit more flexibility within the infrastructure that's been put in. Uh, I understand the hot topic of benches, they will be replaced. Um, uh, we, we need to work out how that's going to work in terms of the removal, but they need that the downtime of them being removed needs to be minimised if th it is right that they're removed at all. Um, we're working through that at the moment, it's the first time. Yeah. T totally. Okay. Yep. No. Noted. And uh, you know the, the 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 infrastructure has given us some flexibility in terms of if this can be moved around, but also power has been put into the uh, some of the areas where it wasn't there before. So, yeah. Noted. And uh, yeah, we'll learn from the uh, the, the criticism received. Councillor Higginson has moved this. Um, do you have a seconder? Okay. Are we um, all in agreement of um, the recommendations um, on agenda item six or 2.1? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. For agenda item seven. Yes. 
if I do this one, yeah. Can I have a show of hands for um, agenda item um, seven and to exclude press and public from um, the next agenda item? Prepare to move, Madam Chairman. Thank you. And um, we'll be turning off the live stream now. Could I, we don't have any information on this at all, so um, I don't even need any, any of this nature, okay. blind if you like. Okay. But we'll move into um, the report itself. Um, we will now stop the live streaming.